Hey, good evening. It's good to see you. Well, good to know that you're there. I can see your names. Well, there's another one just added. This could be fun, huh? Uh, I have 631, so we're just going to give it about a minute um, and, and wait and let a few more people jump on, hopefully. Um, we're, what we're going to try to do is do Facebook Live tonight, of course. Uh, if we get enough people, uh, we'll stay with Facebook Live. Uh, if not, and if we can do it with Zoom, we'll, we'll change it to Zoom uh, later on um, in the month, uh, probably starting next week. Let's see how many people sign up. Uh, let's have faith and believe a lot of people are going to do this. Um, just going to wait a few more moments here uh, before we, uh, we start. Uh, it's good to see Liz and Barb and Ashley. Even Tim Owens is here. Uh, Claudette Young. Uh, and others are joining along. This is great. This is really good. Um, never done this before, to be honest with you. It's a, it's a new genre for me, and we're going to see how, how this works. Uh, I hope you all can hear me. Uh, we're all set up in our dining room here, um, uh, just in, enjoying our, 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 our home here in a beautiful uh, spring-like day. <laughs> We're here, Ralph. Carry on, brother. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's great. Well, listen, here's what you're going to do. I, we're going to be looking very briefly at the book of Luke, uh, but we're going to then concentrate 99% uh, of our time in Acts. So put your finger in Luke 1, verse 1, the beginning of Luke, and also find Acts, which is, of course, right after the Gospel of John. The four Gospels, and then the book of Acts comes. Um, so again, we're going to be doing an overview of the book of Acts, and that will be about four weeks long. Um, after we do that, we'll look forward in the summer to introducing you a, another opportunity we'll talk about some way down the road. Um, it's called the Acts of the Apostles. Let's start there. It's called the Acts of the Apostles, but it's kind of a, a misnomer because... It, it really is the acts of Peter and Paul. Uh, the first half, the first 12 chapters are almost exclusively about Peter. And then 13 through 28 to the end of the book is about the, the ministry of Paul through the Roman Empire. And he ends up in Rome. And so we're really talking about the acts of Peter and Paul. It's also called by some the acts of the Holy Spirit because the whole thing that we're watching unfold in these 28 chapters is the work in the, in the, in of the Holy Spirit in working through uh, men like Peter and Paul and others. Um, and so that's why. But I also would like to say this. Um, it, the book of Acts is your story. All right, a lot of us are doing, you know, looking back at genealogies and, and they want to look at and see what their DNA reveals. Well, your spiritual DNA is found right in this book, right in the book of Acts. Those are your brothers and sisters that were bringing the gospel to the Roman Empire, to the Mediterranean world. And they're the ones who began what we see today. They, they are the ones that we rely on. They're the shoulders that we stand on. So, first of all, who wrote the book? Well, you'd say, Ralph, that's pretty easy. It's, it's, it's Luke. Let's look at Luke chapter 1. I asked you to go there and, and look at the first couple of verses in Luke. And it says, Inasmuch as I have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from the beginning were eyewitnesses and services of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, the most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that you have been taught. All right, who wrote it is the book, is the, we believe, tradition teaches, it, his name was Luke. We find that he's mentioned three times in Paul's letters. Uh, once in Colossians, where he is called the beloved physician. And then in, and it's interesting that in Luke 8, when you t remember the woman who reached up to touch, uh, touch Jesus' garment? Uh, and 
it was only Luke of all the, of the gospel writers who omitted saying that she suffered at the hands of physicians. Some people say that it's got to be Luke. Anyway, the second one is 2 Timothy 4.11. And he says, only Luke is with me. And he's mentioned one more time in Paul's letters. So Irenaeus, a church father in 180 AD, also indicated that it was the Luke that we believe it is. And so we believe Luke wrote this, but he also wrote in consecutive order. And what this means is, is he wrote not only Luke, but he wrote Acts. So 24 chapters in Luke, 28 chapters in Acts, 52 chapters, starting with the birth narratives, the birth of Jesus Christ, and even before that, somewhere around 4 BC to be exact, and all the way through about 65 to 70 AD. So this is a 60 plus year compilation of the history, your history, given to us in what is called Luke Acts. I remember a, a seminary professor once said, there's two books because they couldn't get it all on one scroll. So this is actually just one long book broken into two, all right? So we, we, we'll start with who, but, and to whom did he write? He wrote to somebody called Theophilus. Now, if you know the etymology of that, Theophilus is Theo or, or God or, and, or a God person, God friend, all right? A friend of God. Um, and so Theophilus, some believe, was a, a Roman, uh, a member of the royal family. Um, and so he was writing to this person, explaining to him the gospel in long form in the early history of the Christian church, of our church. When was it written? Well, we know that the book of Acts ends in Rome in, in chapter 28 with Paul is still alive. So this tells us that it was probably written most likely after 65 AD, but Nothing is mentioned in there about what is called the, the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, remember, Jesus said that, that no, one stone would not be left upon another. When the Romans would come in during the Jewish war, which was 66 to 70 AD, and destroy, raise the city, and destroy the temple. That's not mentioned in his history. So some are saying it was probably somewhere between 60 and 70 AD. Why did he write this? Let's look at a few ideas of why would he write Luke and Acts. First of all, it's a challenge to you and me. It's a challenge because the central purpose of the book of Acts is to describe the mission of the early church. And the, one of the operative words used uh, several times in the book of Acts is the word witness. Now, remember, witness comes the Greek word martyreo which is the word we get in the English, martyr. God had called them to witness, not so much in Luke's history to the crucifixion, but a witness to the resurrection. That you and I, standing on their shoulders, as I said earlier, are called to witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, there are several subtexts in this, and the first one would be is that it identified the communities of faith established on Paul's missionary journeys. You know, cities like Philippi and Ephesus and Thessalonica, um, Corinth and others, uh, and then all the churches in the province of Galatia. And so it identifies these people, and then we could put together the letters that Paul wrote and the cities that he visited. But it's also something else, and that is to exhort or to encourage the believers of that day, especially Theophilus, but also to exhort and encourage us to see what God was doing, how God was moving his church it's so quickly and so fast, we would, we would look book at, at Book of Acts and realize that 5,000 became Christians early on in the, in the city of Jerusalem. We'll get back to that. Here's another one in this um, pandemic time. The progress of the gospel is never impeded by persecution. Did you hear that? You can't stop God. You can't stop God. Even during their times of persecution, even when they were thrown in jail, even they, when they were flogged, they would witness and, and with joy 
because God allowed them the privilege of persecution. Another one is the inclusion of Gentiles. The inclusion of Gentiles and the uplifting of the ministry of women in, in the book of Acts, especially the, the inclusion of Gentiles, as we'll get to next week. And then lastly, the, the role of the Holy Spirit to accomplish and guide the church and what God's purpose for them to do. All right? Luke, in my mind, was the most charismatic apostle, or, or I should say writer. All right? He used a term often, was filled with the Spirit. They were, Peter, speaking in his sermons, was filled with the Spirit. Or some, if he went to heal some, they'd be filled with the Spirit. All right? Ephesians 5, uh, 18 says this, Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Don't be controlled by an intoxicating element like wine or alcohol, but be intoxicated with the Spirit. Be, intox be filled. It's not getting more of God. It's God getting, getting more of you. So that's basically the introduction to this book, and I can see several people keep on joining, and, and uh, I hope uh, you, you, if you need some questions about that, you can email me, and I can give you some answers to that, but what we're doing now is we're looking at the book of Acts. We're about to start in the very first verse, um, first couple of verses, and, uh, and we're going to go through, believe it or not, five and a half chapters, if not six chapters, here in the next 20 minutes to half an hour. Are you ready? Are you ready to go with me? Well, let's look at Acts 1, all right? Is everybody there? All right, make sure you're there, all right? Because here's what he says in Acts 1. The first account I compose to you, Theophilus, and I'm sorry, it means friend of God, about what Jesus began to do and teach. That's a reference to the book of Luke. Until the day he was taken up, he began. He's not done. He's still doing his ministry, and he is still accomplishing his ministry. Guess how? Through you and me. Yeah, we're called now, like the apostles were, like the prophets were, like the teachers were, like the evangelists were of that time, to continue the ministry that Jesus started. Amazing, isn't it? He continues with them for 40 days, and they, he says this, I want you to wait in Jerusalem. I want you to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Spirit, the promise that we'll see uh, in chapter 2 in Pentecost. And you know what they said? When's all this going to end? See, in the early church, they expected Jesus to come back very soon. Matter of fact, in their own lifetime. And they said, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And it's interesting what Jesus says. It's not for you to know the times or the epics. Just like he said, no man knoweth the hour, no, the hour, only my Father in heaven. See, it's not for us to speculate. It's us to be prepared and us to be ready. So the next thing is the ascension in, in verses 9 through 11. What I love about the ascension is, is that after they saw Jesus go up in the air, two angels appeared before them, and they're kind of gawking and looking up, and they said, hey, why are you looking up? In the same way that he went up is the same way he will return. What does that say to us? It's going to be a physical return. It's going to be visible, praise the Lord. That's the ascension. And you know how the disciples responded to when Jesus says, you wait in Jerusalem. You know what they did? Look at verse 14, if you're with me in chapter 1. All right, verse 14 says they got on their knees. They prayed. They prayed that they'd be prepared to receive the Spirit. They prayed that they'd be prepared to do what God had planned for them. And they also prayed for the, to find a substitute, if you will, for Judas. They wanted to find somebody uh, to fulfill the, the 12 apostles, and so they, did, they drew by lots, which was not uncommon in the early church or not uncommon in antiquity to do that, and they found a man named Matthias. But there was two prerequisites, if you will. It had to be somebody who had been there from John's baptism, meaning right from the beginning, this person had to see and witness Jesus' ministry, to understand his ministry, that somebody who was, if you will, had received seminary training, all right? 
And secondly, that he had to be a witness, a witness to the resurrection. He had to be willing to say what he heard and what he saw, but he also had to believe and see it himself. You see, I believe that the strongest witnesses of Jesus Christ are those who have come into a personal, loving relationship with him. And they are witnessing to the fact that I, I, I'm not the same person I once was because I've met him. It was like Augustine who said, it, it, when he said, Augustine, Augustine, it is you. And he goes, no, it is not I. He was a new man. He was transformed. So that's chapter one. How are we doing? All right. I'm looking at him. I think, well, you got plenty of time, right? Hey, how about Acts 2? Something that we celebrate on May 31st. It's called Pentecost. It's, based, it's called the Feast of Weeks, and it's 50 days after the Passover. All right, and it's a big day, as we all know. Jesus said, wait. So they were waiting quite a while for the time when the Holy Spirit would be given. So they were in the so-called upper room, and all of a sudden, well, we can hear the train here once in a while from our bedroom, but there was a train running through that upper room. Yeah, I mean, there was a noise that was blowing them away, literally. It was the wind of the Holy Spirit. The same spirit that hovered over the waters in Genesis 1. Imagine that. The Hebrew is ruach. The Greek is pneuma. They both translate spirit or wind. Remember, Jesus told Nicodemus, the Holy Spirit's like the wind. You don't see it, but you know it's there. That's interesting. And then they, they started to, as you know, to speak in tongues. Now, there is some controversy of what they were actually saying. I believe we had to take this pretty much as, as read, and that is they were speaking in other languages. Um, they were all Galileans, they said. And how were they speaking in other languages? And they were praising and glorifying God. That's what they were doing. This is a different language than the angelic language that Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, especially in 13. If I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am a clanging symbol. I do not believe that this is what Paul's talking or uh, Luke is talking about here. He's talking about them speaking in other languages that they didn't even possibly know. But here's what people who witnessed it thought. They're drunk. They've been drinking too much wine. They're full of sweet wine, it says. You see, what happened was they didn't stay in that upper room. The conjecture, and it makes sense because the public witnessed it, they came down for that upper room and they went into the temple courts and they were still speaking in other languages. And people were being freaked out by this, but they knew that the power of God was at work. So what happens? You know what happens. This, the guy who denied Jesus three times, the guy who said, I don't know the man, three times, got up and said, men, right there in, in verse 14, he says, men of Judea, you know what's going on. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, that the spirit will be poured upon all flesh, upon all humankind. Wow. And he said, and then he quotes Psalm 16 and talks about the resurrection and how David is not referring to himself, but he's referring to Jesus because David is still in the tomb. And then he goes on and tells two more that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Davidic promise that his son would sit on the throne forever. Jesus is the son of David and he is the Messiah. Peter's challenge was found in around verse, let me get my glasses here for a second. All right, it says, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, and they said, what do we do? How do we respond to this incredible message? And Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I had a friend who once said, no, it says repent, and each of you be Baptist. No, it doesn't say that. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. See, we need to respond to the message he's saying. And repentance, as you know, literally means to turn around. 
It means it's, it's the word metanoia, to change your mind. Change your mind, you know, and, and accept the fact that we're sinners and we, we are sinners in need of grace. Be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. The last part of chapter 2 is one of my favorite parts, actually, in, in the whole chapter. Uh, it is what I would call the first snapshot of the church, and it's 242 through 47. And if you read with me 242, we will find what we built our small group ministry on at, at our, our prior church. And if you read it carefully, it will tell you what the early Christians were doing together. And they were doing four things, all right? Follow with me. The first one is called the charisma or apostolic teaching. They were coming together to study the word together, to find out what the scripture says about Jesus and see how the prophecies were true and to see how they should then live. Remember, at that point, obviously, they only had the Old Testament to read. But the secondly, it says, is after that, they uh, practiced koinonia or fellowship together. This is more than just being friends. This is sharing your lives together. That's why we believe that small groups were so important. People need to know each other. People need to get to know each other better than just saying hello to each other on a Sunday morning. The third one is the breaking of bread. And people would say, well, is this the Lord's Supper or is this just eating together? Well, they had a thing called the agape feast and they would do both. They would have a meal together and then they would break bread and have the Lord's Supper together. And so perhaps it's referring to both. And the last one is they got together to pray. Well, in our men's study, we were studying James chapter 5. And in James chapter 5, it says that we are to confess our faults to one another and pray for one another. Well, that's why small groups, you know, they're not therapy groups, but there's times where you can learn to be honest with each other. There's times where you can share your need with somebody else. So these four things were occurring. And notice what happens, if you will, in the last verse of chapter 2. Having favor with all people, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. People were flocking to this. They saw that they, they, these people were different. They were being transformed by the Spirit, and they wanted to have a part of it. It begins with Pentecost, and it ends with the snapshot of the early church. All right, we're through two chapters. How are we doing? I had a minute. Just give me a second there. I've been talking too much, which is not unusual. Just ask my wife. And we're going to look at what happens next. See, the early church continued to actually worship on the Lord's Day, which is Sunday, but we believe they probably still went to the temple as well. And we find that the apostles Peter and John were going to the temple in chapter 3. The first 10 verses is 3 in the afternoon. And over on the side is a man we learn later was over 40 years old, but he was lame, paralyzed from his mother's womb. Imagine that. And the only way that he could survive was what some might call handout, but it was really called almsgiving. Peter looks at him, and it says that he fixed his gaze on him. I mean, that'd be almost scary, wouldn't it? And he said, silver and gold I have none, but in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Woo! This isn't Jesus doing it. This is Peter doing it. And sure enough, that man stood up. And he clung, it says, in, in the later verses to Peter from that on. And what happens is that Peter is now opportuned to give a second sermon. And he, first of all, he says, I didn't do this. Don't look at me. Don't look at us. Don't look at John. Remember, this is not us who did it. It, it. We did it in the name of Jesus Christ. And then watch what Peter does. He would not survive in our churches today. He, he'd be too confrontational. He challenges them to the people who are listening. He says, and you killed him. The, the one that we did in his name, in the name of Jesus, you rejected him. And then he warns them that you have been told time and time again that, that there was a Messiah coming, that he would be coming. Moses told you, Deuteronomy 18, 15. 
He said, listen, there'll be another prophet who will come, who will be like me, and meaning who speaks face to face to God. <laughs> he says, all the prophets from Samuel, from the book of Judges and on, all the prophets have testified about this Messiah. And you missed it. How many times have we missed God? How many times we're not looking for him? I want to be more alert, don't you? I want to pray more. I'm moved by these. Everybody says, well, you know, they saw Jesus. I, that's true. Paul saw him later on the road to Damascus. But I, I do believe there's more. So going on in the end of that, we go to chapter 4. We only have two more chapters to go, so hang in there. Chapter 4 is a little different because now the movement is beginning to worry the religious authorities. People don't like it when God's moving because it, make, it reveals their darkness. And sure enough, they, Peter and John, after what they did, this glorious thing, a man who had been like this for over 40 years, and what do the authorities do? Throw him in jail. They arrest him. Because the teaching and preaching was spreading throughout Jerusalem. Throughout the, the, the city of Jerusalem. And the Jesus movement was beginning to alarm them. I want to go back a second to Acts 1.8. So if you keep your finger in four, I want you to go back to Acts 1.8. Because I, to be honest with you, I can't believe I skipped over it. Why? Because it's very important. He says that you will receive power, so you have to wait. But look what he says in verse 8, because this is the theme verse. How could I miss this? The theme verse for the whole book. But you will receive power. And the word power is, I love it, dunamis, which is the word we get for dynamite. You're going to get dynamite, he says, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And what will you do? You shall be my martyrs. You shall be my witnesses. All right? God empowers you. He doesn't call the equip, equipped. He equips the called. And he calls you to something, he'll empower you to do it. You shall be my witnesses. And here's what it is. And I want you to see this very closely. He says it's going to start in Jerusalem. That's where we are. We haven't left Jerusalem yet. But it's going to spread to Judea, which is the surrounding area. And then it's going to go north to Samaria. And we'll see that with Philip in chapter 8. And then it will go to even further north to the second largest city in the whole empire called Antioch. That's where Paul launches most of his missionary journeys. And then eventually he says to the uttermost parts of the earth, which for that world means the Mediterranean world. Because Paul, in the book of Acts, ends up where? In Rome. <laughs> that's why. It's fulfilled. So that's how it begins. And each time it grows, apostolic authority is invested in that. And you'll understand what I mean by that as we go through the book. All right? Let's go back to chapter 4. All right. Sounds good. All right? In verse 5, it says, The next day their rulers, elders, and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And they said, How'd you do this? How'd you get this done? By what power? Remember Acts 1.8? He shall give you power. He'll give you dynamite. By what power did you do this? And they said, we did it in the name. And that word name is repeated often in the early chapters. In the name of Jesus Christ. And he's speaking in front of the Sanhedrin. He's speaking in front of the Jerusalem council. The council consisted of 70 people made of scribes, of elders, Pharisees, and Sadducees. And as you all know, they were Sadducee because they did not believe in the resurrection. I have to throw that in every time I do a class. All right. Go with me to verses 12 and 13. Peter is, is speaking. He says, after he quotes Psalm 118 in verse 11, he says, There is no salvation in anyone else, for there's no other name, remember name, under heaven, 
given among people whereby we must be saved. Now we don't, we could get into the whole discussion of this, but the key point I want to make tonight is the name of Jesus is unique. Yeshua. And salvation is in him. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Now there's different ways of looking at that, and if you have questions about that, I can answer it for you. But in verse 13, it goes on and says two things. They recognize that these were untrained men, uneducated. They didn't go to rabbinical school. They didn't go to seminary. And yet, how did they know all this? And how did they have such power? And I'm going to tell you how. Look at verse 13. They began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. The best school you can go to is the school of Christ. They had spent three years learning and watching the master at work. Huh. So these uneducated men, I hear so many lay people says, I can't do it. And I want to say, yes, you can. If he's on your side. Yes, you can. The Jewish council you know, recognizes that this man had been healed. Something great had happened. So here's what they did. You know, they said, we don't want you to talk about it anymore. We want you to be mute when it comes to this Jesus fella. And I love Peter's answer. <laughs> nope. Nope. I got to do what's right in God's eyes. And if God wants me to speak, then I'm going to do it. So at the end of the chapter, after they leave and they dismiss them, because they're the fear of the crowds, because so many people have already accepted um, who uh, Jesus is. Even priests, high priests, were now being, are starting to come to faith. They went back to the community of faith, all right? They went back to you. And you know what they prayed when they heard Peter's testimony? They said, I hope I can be like that. I hope we can have the same boldness. We have the same courage to speak out what we believe and hold what we believe. And they went into worship and they prayed again. And you'll see that throughout the history, that, the, that prayer is the central motif to the power of God. The, when we pray and we open up our spirit to what God wants to do in our lives, then he will empower us. A prayerless Christian is an oxymoron. If you look at the end of chapter 4, now we're going to get, all right, is anybody from finance on here? Here we go. <laughs> this is what I call the second snapshot of the church. It's about money and possessions. See, here's what they were doing. They were all coming together, and they were, they were making all that they owned, all their possessions, common to everyone. All right? They said there was not a needy person among them. Now, the difference between this and what some say, this sounds like communism. This isn't, because this is voluntary. This is a voluntary submission to the community of faith. It is not mandatory. It said that my money is available if it's needed. My possessions are available if needed. What is it? And then they mention a guy named Joseph, a Cyprian, which means he's from Cyprus, and he's also a Levite, so he has, uh, he has a priestly background. And he is such an incredible guy. I mean, this guy, when you're in his presence, you feel like, man, I want to get to know this guy better. So they called him Barnabas, son of encouragement. Because he encouraged and exhorted everybody. And when they were I went done with him, I have a friend, his name is Denny. Denny is so charismatic that when you're with him, you think you're his best friend. <laughs> that was Barnabas. Barnabas is the one who has been able to touch people deeply. So what happens? What happens is that Two of the members of the faith, Ananias and Sapphira. One of my seminary professors called her Sappy. Ananias and Sappy, a married couple, had this piece of land on, on, on the water, and they decided they were going to sell it. 
And they were going to sell it and they were going to give some of the proceeds to the church. But what they did is they misrepresented, they deceived the church that they, let's just say they sold it for $20,000. But they only gave the church 10. And they pretended that they gave their whole, all the proceeds of this sale to the church. Yeah, we gave you all $20,000. And Peter's listening to this. And Peter's, again, led by the Holy Spirit. And he goes, you bold-faced liar, Ananias. You know you're lying to me, but worse, you're lying to the Holy Spirit and you're lying to God and you're deceiving us. You're lying us and telling us that you, you, you gave us all that money. You didn't do it and you didn't have to do it. It was yours to begin with. And even after you sold it, you could have given only what you wanted to. But you told us and you lied right to us. He was so scared, so taken back by this that Ananias went, Elizabeth, I'm coming. <laughs> and he had this heart attack. He, he, he went into a stroke and died right there. I don't believe it. And it, even worse, they picked him up and buried him without telling his wife. And they waited three hours, and here comes Sappy. Sappy's walking in, says, hey, what happened Oh, she says, well, we just sold some property. And he says, oh, yeah, and you sold it for 20000 And she says, yeah. And Peter's like, oh, no. It's sappy. See those guys over there? Well, they just took your husband out and buried him. And now they're about to take you out and bury you too. Now, some people think this is a cruel example of the early church. It's a different time for sure. But the deception was so great and so paramount in the early years of the church that it could have split it up at the very beginning. Jerusalem is often called the, the first church or the home church of, of Christianity. That, that, that this could not happen. They needed to stay together. They needed to be bound together. And ironically, if you look at verse 11, Verse 11 is the first mention of the word church in the book of Acts. The church is now being challenged to be faithful to God. The church is now being challenged to be truthful with one another. Speaking the truth in love, says Paul in Ephesians. I've been around the church now longer than maybe I, than I wish sometimes. Why are we so dishonest with each other? Why, it's, sometimes we have to be honest with each other and sometimes we have to tell the truth. Peter told the truth and Peter told them what would happen to them. That's a hard thing to take. The end of chapter 5 concludes with a second encounter with the authorities. This time, they want to throw him in jail. They do so. They are released miraculously by the Holy Spirit and by an angel. They go back to their community of faith. Here's what I love. Let me just read a part of it here as I'm getting near the end. Once again, Peter tells the authorities in verse 29, we must obey God rather than men. In verse 32, and we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Verse 33, but when they heard this, this is the, the authorities, they were cut to the quick. They were convicted so deeply that they wanted to kill him. Let's kill this guy. What do we want to do when people tell us the truth? We want to remove them from our lives. But there was a Pharisee, a wise, wise teacher, Gamaliel. He said, guys, hold off. Hold on a second. See, God will use people that don't even know they're being used by him. He said, you know, this has happened before. This has happened before and it all went away. 
You know, they, he cited a couple examples. He said, and if it's like that, if it's a sociological thing, this is going to go away. So don't fight it. But if this is of God, if this is of Yahweh, the king of Israel, then you're fighting God. And you don't have a chance. So they took his advice. And after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and once again said, don't speak in the name of Jesus. Now, we, we pass over that word flog very easy, but remember, normal flogging was a lash used with a cat and nine tails 39 times. Why? Because the Old Testament prescribes that the most is 40, so they always did one less than the 40. And here's what blows you away, is that they rejoiced that they were flogged in the name of Jesus. They rejoiced that they were given the privilege of being, a, being persecuted for his namesake. The last verse of chapter 5. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Messiah. In other words, persecution never stops the movement of God's people. It only expands it. It only grows it. And so when we think we're down and we're being incarcerated in our own homes, what can God be doing in our lives and in our hearts? When we're seeing a world that we don't know sometimes how it's working out, we realize that the God who led Peter in these first 12 chapters is the same God that leads you and I. It's the same Holy Spirit that can fill us with his power and his presence so that we can accomplish the things he calls us to do. You see, God's not finished with me yet just because I'm retired. Matter of fact, I'll retire when I'm six foot under and when they carry me out. My question is, how about you? How about you? Well, I see a lot of people joining in and some joining in a little late uh, um, or, you, or you're just saying something to me now, I don't know. But either way, it's, I've, I've enjoyed this. It's 713 I shot for 7:15. This is going to continue next week. Uh, we'll uh, we'll start in chapter six and and read uh, probably about six more chapters or so and get to the to Paul's ministry. We'll complete Peter's next week and and continue a little bit in Paul's, um, and then we'll finish up uh, with two weeks after that. And we're going to conclude with Paul end up end up in in Rome. Um, so let's close in a word of prayer, and, and I hope that you are able to, to learn some things tonight, because right? I know I always love doing this. Uh, and, and even though I can't see me, uh, see you, I should say, you, you bless me. Uh, and from a few names I see from, from Great Bridge, why are you on here? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Love you too. <laughs> let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. For your word, and I thank you, Lord, is when your word is in, it is assimilated and integrated into our life and our minds and our hearts, it can change us from the inside out. It can make us people that believe even stronger in you and be a witness to your resurrection and to your power. Lord, that we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear. If God be for us, who can be against us? No one. For greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And Lord, and there is nothing, no nothing, that we can do if you called us to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and I'll see you next week. Bye.